They have to fit the criteria to get into Aston Hall. The criteria being parents who don't give a shit. Parents who are not going to listen. So that's for kids getting abused and coming forward. Nobody would believe them. And you're a mental defective. You've been diagnosed by a psychiatrist. Who's going to let you be in the mental hospital? Who's going to listen to you? And I told the nurse, there's blood on my back. I thought my back was bleeding. Because there was no blood. There was no, there was no injury. So I thought it was me back. And she went, no, that happens sometimes after you've had treatment. Let's touch on about the three boys who were found in the water dead who were in Ashton Hall. Okay. Let's get into that. Right, it wasn't three boys. It was quite a few. Was that more than three? Oh, more than three, yeah. Killing kids. And a lot of the young girls you were getting pregnant, you were getting pregnancy tests also in this place. An STT test. As young as 12. As young as 12. It's fucking sick. I'm going to leave a little bit out there because it's a bit distressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. She started tying up the hands. And we're on. And we're on. And today's guest, we've got Barbara O'Hare. First of all, Barbara, just want to say thanks for coming on the show. You're more than welcome, James. Um, I read your book, The Hospital. Thank you. Powerful, sad, also very heartbreaking for anybody that's not seen it or read it. Um, it's about a mental institution, young kids getting drugged, abused, killed. But you're not here just to talk about the book. You're here to talk about other things, which a connection to Jimmy Savo, Epstein, exposing the higher people at the elite that's involved in these paedophile rings. It's kind of all connected, same as Aston Hall, where, was it Milner, Dr. Milner? That's right. Who grew up with, um, has a connection with Jimmy Savile and the abusing the kids. So, first of all, how are you? Uh, a bit tired after the journey. <laughs> but very glad to be able to get the story out in more of a timeline rather than how can I put it over you? Okay, the book is very open. And to write the book, to be honest with you, James, was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because I had to literally relive the experience and take it as far as I could go mentally. And I did take it as far as I could go without going, how can I wear it? Too far. Because mentally I couldn't cope. If it hadn't been for me ghostwriter, Veronica Clark, I would have never got that book out ever. Because yeah. I stopped. I said, I can't cope. And it took us a lot longer than we thought it was going to take because reliving it and then, how can I put this? You'd get through one chapter and you'd say, through that chapter. Now I've got to talk about that one. You'd need, a, you'd need 10 days a week, sometimes only three days. It depended how you handled it at the time and whatever else was going on in your life before you could do the next chapter because you had to think of the reader. I mean, what happened in Aston Hall was out on its own in one respect, but it wasn't out on its own in another respect because similar things were happening not just in England, but worldwide. Worldwide. It was happening in America, in America as well. Yeah. Um, I've got one in particular person I'm referring to when I talk about America who's left a comment on my Amazon um, I forget what her name is. It was Love to Read, but she's changed it. And she tells her story of her situation, very, very similar to Aston Hall, same drugs, the same abuse. It was like a free for all for whoever at the time. Yeah, the pedophiles. Do you think worldwide it's all connected, these rings? 100%. So you get took into Aston Hall when you were 12. Mm -hmm. What was your life like prior to that, to Aston Hall? Very, very difficult. I didn't have any childhood whatsoever. We're talking about no happy childhood memories of playing in the park or nothing like that. I was very troubled. Um, my mother was a travelling woman. Um, she was in an abu abusive marriage. And to say it this way, you know, when two women, two ex-wives, walk away and leave their children with the father, then there's got to be something wrong somewhere. It, not necessarily going to be the mother. Although I've got no love for me, mother, I've got to stick up for her in the right angle as well. Because I wasn't just left, my half-brother was by another woman as well. So, he, you know, 
there's got to be something really wrong there. As far as I know, it was domestic abuse. Yeah. So you were you rebellious at that ages from like early ages? Up no, to not at all. Not at all. I was a very um, quiet child. I was quite a tomboy. I was a little bitch for jumping up trees and got if I got a chance. <laughs> Um, I was never the little girl with the doll's houses and the doll's prams. No, they had to be operated on, the legs had to be removed and God knows yes. what, you know, the hair had to be done. But as well as that, I wasn't given the opportunities of your average child as well. That was stolen away from me because I was left in a house for I don't know how long. I've got no idea because day went into night, night went into day. I've got no how long, I, I don't know how long I was in that house by myself, so. Were you abused? At that age, before 12? Uh, when you say abused, what do you mean? Well, mentally you were abused, but physically? I was beat. Beaten? Beaten, I was badly beaten. I had this woman. My dad used to pay this woman to look after me. My dad worked away on the oil rigs. He had a few quid. So people liked him because he had a few quid. And he looked like um, Elvis Presley. He had the look and the mm -hmm. suave. And he had the women falling off his feet. He was a bit of like a dog with two dicks, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been called that a few times as well. <laughs> well, you know. And I remember one in particular time, this foster woman, she was Scottish. I obviously not going to name her, but she, uh, dead anyway. But she had a gang of kids and she just used to get the money off my dad for looking after me, but she never looked after me. She used to leave me in the house by myself. But on one in particular occasion, my stepmother, would have been my stepmother, was her sister and she had a baby to me dad. And she was all over this baby, which was my brother. She eventually left him as well and left the baby and my dad. And I was playing on the floor in the living room with them, with the, with the little fella. And the big boy come in, he was about 17, 18. And I had my hand on the floor, just like that. And as you can see with this finger here, you can see the damage. You see? Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, what he did was he came over and he put, he had like workman boots on. He put the heel of the boot into my hand and twisted it round. And I could hear the bone cracking. I could hear it crunching. And as you can see, it's left that way. There was all that kind of thing. And they used to come in drink, drunk. And I, I used to have to sleep in a pull-down bed with them downstairs, a brown PVC one. And he used to make me scratch his feet because his feet used to itch. And he used to make me scratch his feet, scratch his feet, and scratch his feet. And if I stopped, I'd get a kick. So... Yeah, and then the foster woman came, and that's when the beating started. They were they were quite bad. Yeah. So when you get took to Ashton How Ashton Hall. Um, Hall, you were twelve. Well, what happened was, I was with this foster woman who was one evil, nasty, wicked. I can't express how bad she was. She was the world's worst nightmare. And what I used to do was her husband was the loveliest man you could meet. I loved him. He treated me like his little princess. He never had no kids, and he, that was her second husband. They never had no kids together. He used to call me his little Colleen. He used to teach me how to box. He had a great time for me. Every Friday when he got paid, he'd come in with chocolates for us. And he used to hide sixpences behind the bathroom door. He was what, you know, if you wanted a dad, he was the dad you'd want. Oh. So I used to be terrified to go home until he finished work because I knew what I'd get when I got home so what I used to do was play up in school I was a bitch so that I get detention and then when I got the detention that I mean I'd get home and she wouldn't have chance to beat me because he'd be home before me what I didn't realize while I was playing this game I was only a little kid I'd only just 11 at the time that I was putting myself into a very vulnerable situation Cut a long story short, I've got all the medical social services reports and I've got files of whatever. Uh, what I didn't realise was I was putting myself in this bad situation. And um, they shipped me off to a remand home in Derby. Yeah. I was 12 years old. Apparently it was illegal to put, well, from the files that I've got here, it was illegal to put a child into a remand home under lock and key under the age of 14 without first going before a judge. Obviously, this didn't go before a judge. I'm in this remand home and I'm meeting girls from all walks of life, tricks I've never even heard of. You know, it was all way out of my calibre. 
Yeah, I might have robbed a few apples or plums off an apple tree and I might have played up in school, but some of the stuff that these girls were talking about was like alien to me. So I'm in this remand home and I'm told that the doctor's coming to see me. So I said, why? Well, you're not well, you need to see a doctor. And he might take you to his hospital. Well, when you're in a remand home and you're 12 years of age, and in this remand home, there's a cage in the cellar where girls are locked in and you know they're locked in and you see stuff you don't want to see. You see girls ripping one another's face off, basically. And you know you've got a lot to contend with. When you think a doctor's coming in to take you to a hospital, you think, yeah, come and get me. So eventually, to cut a long story short, this doctor turned up this day. I'll never forget it. There was a sick room above the front door. There was a porch on the front door. And above that door was this, what they called a sick bay. So I was talking to this room, and I remember sitting there. There was a single bed in there, and there was a sink. And I was thinking, I never had my own bedroom. And I was thinking, oh God, I'd love my own bedroom. I'd have this here and that there, little things kids think of, you know. And what happened was, uh, this doctor came in, and he took my hand. And he said, oh, he said, you bite your nails. Now, that's one thing I never did do. I was taught, if you bite your nails, you've got worms. Right, so never did bite my nails. He said, you're going to have to come into my hospital course, but look at your nails. And then he took my hand, and then he started stroking it. And he said, oh, you poor child, you poor child. It was weird. And I thought, whatever, get me in the hospital, I don't care. Because in my mm -hmm. head, I'm thinking, you get me in that hospital, I'm legging it, right? I'm thinking, teddy bears, fairy slippers, bowls of fruit, comics. Mm -hmm. What would any 11, 12 year old girl think? So then straight away, immediately, he started me on these tablets. I don't know what they were. Well, I had to take them. They were two little white tablets with black writing on. I can remember them. I don't know what they were. I had to start taking them straight away from that day. And a few weeks later, I was shipped over to Aston Hall, who I'd never heard of, didn't know nothing about it. These two social workers came in a little car, a two-door car, and they got me in the back. Now, them days, the social workers always had two-door cars, so you couldn't escape, right? And the man was driving, and the woman had a load of files. And I remember being at a certain point, I'll never forget it, it's still prominent in my head, this juncture on the road where there's a big white pub, and she said to the, the driver, she said, Someone's going to answer for all of this one day. Something's not right. And I sat in the back and I listened to what she said and I swore to myself I'm never going to forget her words. So it was quite an acute 12 year old because whatever she said was words to the effect someone's going to answer in the future. And then words are still with me to this day. We arrive at Aston Hall, drive through these gates. And then I see the words mental hospital and I start going hysterical. I went, hang on a minute. What, what, where do you think me, mental hospital? I didn't know what a mental wo uh, hospital was, but, you know, it obviously wasn't good. And she went, no, 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 you're not going to that part, you're going to another part. Right, so to take me to this ward. I don't really want to go too much into all of that because of the time element, number one. Number two, it's quite boring. And number three, everyone in, wants to hear the nitty gritty, right? So I'm eventually led into this office where this Dr. Milner is, but he's not the nice doctor who was stroking my hand. He's not that same guy. He doesn't even look up from his desk. He just went, no tea for you. I didn't understand what was going on. Normally when you got transferred from one children's home to another, you'd have all the kids running up to you saying, what home have you come from? Who do you know? Who do you know that staff and all of that crap? But not in this home. They were all like somatized. There was a a vibe about the place that oh cold eerie. It's scary. Very, very scary. Anyway, this nurse takes me out. She gave me this brown stuff. I start feeling drowsy. She said, We're taking her upstairs, she said. They take me upstairs and they've got these bathrooms, but they haven't got one bath in, they've got two baths in, they've got like handicapped equipment in there, right? 
And she runs a bath, and I swear to God, this bath was six inches deep. And it was tepid, right? She went, right, get in there. Made me strip off in front of her. I was very self-conscious. But you don't argue with these people. So no sooner am I in the bath, it took me years to cop on what it was about. It only took me till about three years ago to cop on what that was all about. So it gets in the bath. No sooner in the bath, you're out, towel around you. And then she weighed you and measured you. And then um, she came with this gown. Now, to describe this gown, people will think straight jacket, but no, it wasn't a straight jacket. Think of a hospital gown, how it's got two arms and a neck and it dies at the back. Yeah, so... It was like that, but it was thick, proper, thick, heavy canvas. Nasty, grey, dirty looking colour. And heavy that you couldn't bend your arms, but your arms were accessible. And it tied at the back. It was that he heavy, you could barely walk with it, right? And then just along from the bathroom, there's a stairs where they brought you up, and then there's this room. Now in this room, there's a window, but it's got shutters on the inside, yeah? There's a mattress on the floor, a black rubber mattress, and nothing else, that's it. So the nurse tells me to lay down on the mattress. No sheets on this mattress, a rubber mattress. No pillar. So you're kind of like, you're half drugged up, you comply, you don't want to comply. The bigger part of you wants to fight, but you know you can't fight. Next minute anyway, she drags in this trolley. I can still, still see that trolley. It's a cream trolley, like cream and animal, like the old pans you used to get, like kind of like that. And she pulled it in and it squeaked. And on top was a kidney dish. There was old grey bandages that had been used. And there was little sachets of... Do you know when you go like, to the Mackey's and you get salt? Mm -hmm. Like little packets. Packets. Like packets, like similar to that. And an injection. And water. So she says to me, put one arm across the other arm. Meaning, put this arm across that arm in a cross, which I did. And then she started tying up my hands. Yeah. I'm gonna leave a little bit out there cause it's a bit distressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. She started tying up the hands. And then she says, open and close your hand, meaning this hand. So I had to open and close this hand like this, yeah. And she started rubbing like this, up your arm with her, uh, with her thing till the vein came up here. And then she went to the trolley and she I can remember so well, she flicked this paper thing, this little sashy salt thing, flicked it. And then she mixed it with the water and put it in the injection. The injection was not a small injection, trust me. It was a big thing. How big was the needle? Well, I was 12. And if you ask me how big a needle was now, I'd say 16 foot, because I'm terrified of needles. But it was an old-fashioned needle. It wasn't like today's modern syringes. So it was a big one. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she comes back and she gets that vein back up again. And she puts the needle in. I felt myself turn to stone. As if I was a statue. I couldn't move. I was conscious, but I couldn't move. I don't know if I could blink. But it felt like you were sinking into the black mattress. You're going deeper and deeper. Then she pulls the trolley and she says, show yours, doctor. And then Dr. Milner would come in to this dark room. And you could see him with these cushions, black rubber cushions, similar to the cushions you get on wheelchairs, maybe a bit narrower, three of them. And he had them under his arm. He had a white jacket on. 
And he laid the cushions down next year on the floor. Let's just think for a minute now. You're a 12 year old little girl. Sexually, you're innocent. You haven't got a clue. You don't know. I didn't. I didn't know anything. I'd never seen anything rude in my life. I might have sworn once or twice, but I'd never known And I was an innocent kid. Naive. Definitely naive. And then, um, he put them cushions down and he lay down beside me. I didn't see it coming. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know what was happening. The next minute, it's like, you know how I'm going to describe it? I'm going to describe it. Do you know a champagne bottle? Yeah. You know the wire cap that goes on the top? Mm -hmm. I'm going to describe it as a massive one of them. That's how it felt. And it had some kind of cotton wool or lint on it. And it just went straight over your face. And you just felt the fluid straight away and smelt it. And you went out of it. Completely. Gone. Come around a little bit and you'd hear him talking to you, asking you silly questions. How old's your brother? You'd answer. But you shouldn't answer because as soon as you answer, he's going to put more on to knock you back out. But you haven't got the ability not to answer. You don't know. You don't understand. If it happened to you today, you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't have the ability. And you're a big man. Mm-hmm. So every time you answered, he knew that you were alive and that you were breathing or whatever. I don't know what the hell he was doing. He'd knock you back out. Every time you come back round... You've been a different angle to what you was before. So, for an example, when he first knocked me out, I'm lying back on the mattress flat. But when I came round, I wasn't. I was facing the wall with the mattress and his hand over me. Then I'm coming round again. And this time, I've got my face to the left, but I'm lying on my stomach, but you can still angle the mask. Do you understand me? Mm-hmm. And this went on for eight months. But the worst part about it was, on the first occasion, when it happened, I had no idea what the hell was going on in this place. I didn't know. I came around, and I'm in the dormitory. I'd been introduced to my bed and my dormitory by the nurse the night before. And I'm in my dormitory, and this is... I'm embarrassed to say this as a woman... And I'm embarrassed for the little girl I'm talking about as well because she was only a little girl. I was only 12. Something wasn't right. And I knew it. I knew something had happened to me. And I don't want to go into further detail, but it wasn't right nor natural. Uh And I told the nurse, there's blood on my back. I thought my back was bleeding because there was no blood. There There was no injury. So I thought it was me back. And she went, no, that happens sometimes after you've had treatment. Fucking scumbag. But this is very brave, for, first of all, for coming forward and telling your story. I and, need to. And even... I need the people who this has happened to, to listen to me. Mm-hmm. So that they can know. I thought for 46 years it was only me. I knew there was other kids in Aston Hall. Obviously, I knew there was other kids there. I re- there's some of the survivors that's come forward I remember that were there. But I need other survivors to realise, listen, you're not responsible. You did nothing wrong. Yeah. You're the victim. It's the people who still be confused because you say at the time, I've got it wrote down here, you were in the ha- human toys in the, hands from, in the hands of monsters. You were toys for people getting drugged, raped, and even killed. Were they taking vulnerable kids who... I've looked into Milner very deeply. Right, let's very, go into Milner. This is a guy who worked at, there for yeah, 30 years. Let's Milner. go right in about him. What was Milner up to? I'm sorry I got a little bit tearful there. That's okay, that's understandable. I don't cry for myself. I cry for the 12-year-old little girl that was destroyed back there. Yeah. I can't bring her back and I can't put her right. Oh, what I try to do is put everybody else right. Mm-hmm. It's my way of coping with it, yeah? Okay, that's that. Milner. Milner originated and was born as an only child in Wakefield in 1909. He was born in Lincoln Street, Wakefield. 
Don't ask me anything about Milner because I will tell you everything about him. Yeah, good. I have dug that deep, right? He went to Wakefield Comprehensive School and he graduated into Leeds University. Okay, where he went to study medicine. In 1942, possibly 42, I could be wrong on the year, he got a job in Dartmoor Prison as medical super, deputy superintendent in Dartmoor, in Devon. Yeah? Not too much about that. No big nothing about it, but he seemed to have climbed the ladder rather quickly, going from a doctor to medical superintendent in Dartmoor Prison that quick. I mean, let's look at him. He was born 1909. He graduated when he was 29 into a doctor. Because, you know, whatever they do to be doctors, took his oath into it when he was 29. So in 1942, he's now medical superintendent of Dartmoor Prison, working for the Home Office. Yeah, obviously. In my research, I've read a lot of stuff about Dartmoor Prison. In particular, I've read a book called Cruel Britannia by a guy called Ian Cobain, Scouser. Journalist, I think it was the Independent he was a journalist for, who does a lot of research into Dartmoor. And it turns out, this you're going to find quite shocking, it, it turns out that there was actually cages and interrogation cages, interrogation cages in Dartmoor Prison. So if he's medical superintendent, he's well aware of that. And this is where we come into the interrogation this is where we're working from now, about the interrogation, yeah? So Milner was working in Dartmoor while the French soldiers were being interrogated by the MI5 and by whoever else. And this was all hush-hush. It was called Cage 001, okay? There was also another cage in London called Cage... 0020, and that was again only used for interrogation purposes. It was actually a gang of um, Victorian houses that were knocked together and they were used for interrogation purposes and interrogation experiments. Okay, so Milner was obviously acquainted with that. So now let's take a look at what happens with Milner next. He moves on to become medical su deputy medical superintendent of Rampton. Yeah. Then he moves on into Broadmoor. While at Broadmoor, he gets transferred to Aston Hall. Aston Hall opens its doors basically in 1947, the year the NHS kicked off. That's the year Milner took over Aston Hall. However, in 1957... An MP asked the, how, the Home Office, why is there five-year-old children in Broadmoor Prison? And the Home Office, if you check on Hazard, I'm sorry I haven't got the printout for that. I have got it available. Yeah, that's okay, we can put I, links. I, 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 can, yeah. I can give it to you. I will not say nothing unless I can back it up, mm -hmm. right? Ha, uh, the, uh, the Houses of Parliament replied, the five-year-old child in question is very hard to manage. Nobody else can manage him, so he's had to go to Broadmoor, five years of age. Yeah? However, we've built two villas and a school for the delinquent children, or words to that effect, in Broadmoor. Okay. Let's take a look at Broadmoor. Where's your schools and villas? Oh, I see. They're not there. Well, that's funny, because Aston Hall Hospital has got two villas being built the same year you're referring to, and a school. And all of these children are getting shipped in from every corner of the country, literally, literally every corner of the country, from Newcastle, from Scotland, from Oxford, from uh, Bristol, uh, where's the other fellow? Cornwall, shipped, all shipped in via these homes... And they have to fit the criteria to get into Aston Hall. The criteria being parents who don't give a shit. Uh -huh. Parents who are not going to listen. 
So that's for kids getting abused and coming forward. Nobody would believe them. And you're a mental defective. You've been diagnosed by a psychiatrist. Who's going to let you be in the mental hospital? Who's going to listen to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a big setup. It's a paedophile ring, grooming kids, abusing them, drugging them, experiments. There's a book written... Yeah, I can't think of the year. By one Dr. Michael Kraft. Ten personalities of the schizophrenic or something like that. It's on Amazon. Twenty pound. It's actually a home office report for the electronic treatment that he was given to the children that had come from scout groups who'd broke a glass window in a fucking greenhouse. Children were getting shipped into him for electric shock treatments. This book is available widely on Amazon. Give me my phone, I'll get it up, I'll show you it. It's on my orders, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you graphs of where these children come from, the age, right? Now, what happens to Dr. Michael Kraft, who was a superintendent of Boldstone's mental institution, which is a sister hospital to Aston Hall, by the way. And these were all funded by the NHS? These are all funded by the NHS, yeah. Oh, I've got something else to tell you about Aston Hall. It's going to blow your brains out. And where does he go? Oh, I know. I've just remembered. Yeah, but he lost his job. He left his job in Boulderstones, the sister hospital where Jimmy Savile frequented. Uh, he's lost. His, he's left his job there. And guess where he's gone? He's gone to the Welsh homes. Uh, if you look in the Lost in Care report by Alison Taylor, right, the bigger Welsh abuse scandal, right? Uh, can't, I can't pronounce the world's name. Still the truth. He's been shipped down there. Now, all the children who's down there claiming they've been sexually abused are suddenly shipped up to a mental hospital in Derbyshire where their brains are getting washed away. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. You with me? Yeah. Okay. On top of which, let's talk about medical uh, experimentation. Okay. Oh, it's so dramatic. It didn't happen. It doesn't happen in this world. It does happen. To kids and adults. It happens. It happened in Aston Hall. Oh. Right. I will back up my words. Okay. There's a syndrome called, I can't pronounce it, a Kleftem, Kleftem, Kleftemus syndrome, some name like that, XXYZ syndrome. And what they were doing, they got the research from Leeds University. This is according to a medical journal that I have got, right? Dated 1969. I was in 71. So this is before I went there, right? They were sticking, knocking the kids out, the boys in particular, mainly boys. Oh, other stuff I've found, I've just remembered as well. Sticking swabs up their backsides to have a look to see did they have a certain gene that would determine whether they were going to be murderers or rapists. Weird, freaky, wait till you hear this. They were also doing another experiment where they were counting the ridges in your hands and your fingers for the, you know, when you're in the womb, the what's called atomic f- uh, fluid. Yeah. And they were counting the ridges on them to see if they would determine if you were a mental defective, a murderer, whatever, schizophrenic. They were applying for research grants to do this and they were getting them. And then they were saying, and I will give this to you in black and white as big as you want, right? A massive thank you to Dr. Kenneth Milner of Aston Hall Hospital for allowing us to examine his patients. Also, a massive thank you to Leeds University for the research grant. What do you make of that? Yeah. I haven't put that there. That was there before I ever went to Aston Hall. So they were taking swabs from the young boys to see if they're going to be a rapist or a murderer, but why would they search for those specific things? Were they getting injected with certain stuff to maybe make them into one or the other because they say see some of the big um, sealets, some of the school shootings some of the high profile names that get killed some people say they've had uh, some certain treatments or certain injections to trigger their brain so they can brainwash them to go and do certain things okay let's look at the drug that was given to us okay the main drug of choice okay that drug was called sodium amatam right what is sodium amatam and where does it come from let's take a look at that is that right. a truth serum? serum? Right. Sodium amatel comes from Colombia, right? And it grows wild. It's known as the bogota, the bogota tree. It produces the most beautiful white flowers, massive white flowers, like a white lily. However, it then produces like a knot that forms into like walnuts. And that is the drug. 
It is said that if you've had this drug, you've met the devil. This is the common belief in Colombia. Do not sit under that tree and fall asleep. Right? And what they're doing in Colombia, have a look. Is it okay to recommend? Yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. Fine, right, yeah. wherever I can give yeah, the link, yeah. yeah. Have a look on Vice, on YouTube, at the Vice video, The World's Most Scariest Drug. And that will show you what sodium amatel is, its abilities. So you can crush these walnuts down into a white powder. And I can blow it into your face and say to you, go to the ATM and give me all your money. You haven't got the ability to say no. You're like a robot. You're going to go and do it. You won't remember it. And the advice actually show a situation where a man, it happened to him. I think he was a tourist. I don't know who he was. I can't remember. But it happened to a man and he went and he emptied out his whole apartment and gave it to these thieves. And then he asked the man on the door, what happened last night? Where's all my stuff? And he said, well, you give it away. And I couldn't stop you. You, you just give it away. And you believe this drug was getting used in, years in the 70s, 80s, 70s? And no, I don't how. believe that. I know that. Yeah. I've got the documentation to prove it. Mm -hmm. Look in the back of my book. Did you see I put the documentation yeah. in? You want to call me a liar? You want to kill me? Mm -hmm. The government want to come and send the boys in black? Come. You ain't going to change the truth. Yeah. The scary thing is you've been trying to tell your story for years. Nobody yeah. believed you until you eventually got the documents and now people are starting to sit up and take notes that you were telling the truth. How hard was that for you that no one would believe you at the start? For so Do many years. you know years? the hardest part of it, right? My ex-husband, I confided in him what had happened to me. And instead of support me, I got a load more abuse. He started calling me crazy. Barbara, turn me on kids against me. She's crazy. She's been in the mental hospital all of her life. So instead of getting the support where I thought he'll help me to prove this, it went the opposite way. And it put me into a very lonely, deep, depressive place. Lonelier. Yeah. A harder place. It doesn't matter now anyway, because at the end of the day, you know, there were certain people via social media, let's throw our cards on the table as people have got to hold my hands up to. Um, Mandy Copeland from the CSA in Nottingham, they're uh, an organisation that helps all of the children that was abused in the homes in the Nottingham. None that was linked to them, by the way, so was Jimmy Savile. They helped me so much to get the police investigation going. Without them this would have never come to light. You know, without my publishers believing me or my agent believing me, because when I was going to the media, they were, they were keeping it local, a little, a little bit of this here and there, you know, to keep me pacified. It wasn't going national. It was only my publishers and the PR team that they put forward that put this out on the news, out on the Victoria Derbyshire show or Good Morning Britain or wherever it was that people started phoning in. And what it did was it made it too many people come forward that the police couldn't cover it up anymore. Yeah. And that was the plan of action. That's the thing. You create enough noise because, listen, there's there's dirty nonsense in the police, if not higher up, who are calling the shots, who can cl quite clearly cover things up. But if you create enough noise, if you give people enough voices, they can't hide from it. They can't turn away. That is the beauty now of things like social media, these kind of channels, there's enough platform there for people to tell their story, for people to listen and sit up and go, fuck me, I don't... Because see, when you speak that, people who are living in a life of luxury do not have a clue what's going on in the inner world where people are going through this torment and trauma and pain and misery because there's so many lost souls out there with no voice who are too scared to come forward because if you're in a mental world, you're going to think, if you're in there for such a young age, then you hit 34, you're going to think you are mentally insane. You do. You start fucking blaming yourself. Well, There's... if the doctors said it, and the nurses have said it, and you're only a kid, yeah, you're going to you believe can't it. argue with yeah. them. Do you know how many lives have been destroyed by this? Hmm. Do you know, I mean, you spoke to Stephen before, yeah? Yeah. Look at Stephen him, he's a Wright. highly, highly intelligent man. Mm -hmm. Very intelligent. Very, given, very, very gifted man. Mm -hmm. And he had the most horrendous upbringing, Right. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to sell his book or not. I'm just saying, as an example, there is a highly intelligent man who's a brilliant artist, brilliant musician. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Smith, sorry. Yeah, Stephen Smith, yeah. I've met survivors that would blow your brains away with their 
gifts of what they can do, but they have never pushed themselves because Milner labelled them as children. So they've never felt the ability to prove or to succeed in the world. They've yeah. always felt the underdog. They've got a chip on the shoulder because he put it there and uh, you can't yeah. erase that chip. For an example, <coughs> I was 28 when I passed my driving test. Truth of the matter is I've been driving for years. I've been driving since I was 12. Well, since I got out of Arsenal, to tell you the truth. I never had the confidence to go for my driving test because I didn't feel adequate to everyone else. They could all do it. They're all okay. They've never been in the mental hospital, but I couldn't do it. But one day I went for my driving test and I passed flying colours. And I sat there and cried. And the man said to me, why are you crying? And I couldn't tell him why I was crying. I never felt that I would be, have the ability to be like the rest of the world. That's what Milner done. Because you're getting told you're not good enough. Mud sticks. If you believe, if you somebody, you tell something that they're not good enough long enough, they're going to eventually believe it. Yeah. But the beauty of life, you can change the way you think. We just that self belief that you can tell your story, you can pass your driving test. Let's touch on about the three boys who are found in the water dead who are in Ashton Hall. Okay. Let's get into that. Right, it wasn't three boys. It was quite a few. Was that more than three? Oh, more than three, yeah. Hell. Right, let's have a look at... Um, I've got some... But you've got documents here. I've just printed some stuff yeah. off. There's quite some interesting stuff here. Mm -hmm. Right, but this in particular one that I want to... talk about is a, a young man, and it troubles me deeply. His name was Barry White, and he was 24 years of age. And he was an informal patient and had been an informal patient for some time, a couple of years. So he had no need to run away because he was an informal patient. He wasn't sectioned. He had the ability or the freedom to say, open the door, I want to go. Just like all of us did when we were kids, but we weren't told that. We were made to believe that we had to be kept under high security, and we was kept under high security, yeah? The windows didn't open. There was mm. no fire escape. You know, we were took to school by security guards. One boy I can think of, obviously I can't name him. I wish I could. If, if I found him, he'd probably say, yeah. You know, when he escaped from Aston Hall, he had MI5 looking for him. That's all on his medical reports, by the way. Anyway, Barry White, 24 years of age, escapes from Aston Hall, even though he's an informal patient. So he could have signed out, walked he out He could have anytime. walked out any day he wanted. He was not a danger to, to anybody, okay? And... Um, he gets chased and just like many others, runs into the River Trent that run directly behind the mental institution. If you look at all the mental institutions across the country, which I have done, you will find they're always backed onto a canal. Okay? Quite interesting. Anyway, he runs into the River Trent and drowns. He doesn't just drown because, believe it or not, I've seen his death certificate. All right? He was mangled by some kind of water mill. He was really badly cut up, okay? And he was wearing Aston Hall overalls at the time. He was buried in Leicestershire. Even though he died in Nottingham, he was buried within 24 hours in Leicestershire. His family was not informed of his death and he was not formally, ident uh, formally identified. And there's a report from a coroner you can see for yourself. Yeah, yeah. We'll put this up on the screen so people can see. So this right. is a young boy who could have been out any time, but yet chose to drown himself, which is, how are you going to drown yourself? Your, your instincts will kick in where... Well, that's one mean. boy. I've got the other three to talk about. Uh, three young lads. Now, this really puzzles me. It troubles my mind a lot. Three young, young fellas. Um, I would say the same age group, right? I haven't got that piece of paper with me at the moment, but I will give it to you. I'll email it to you. Um. So they decide they're going to escape, or so it seems. And a farmer witnesses these three fellas walk into the River Trent, literally walk into the River Trent, continue walking, do not run, do not swim, do not attempt to any survival tactics which would be normal. Yeah, your instincts, survival instincts. They walk in. into the water until they're under the water and drowned. Three of them at once. Farmer couldn't help them. So did you, do you think they're drugging the boys? I think that was an experiment. Telling them what to do to see if they would do it? That was, yeah. How far sodium amateur will go? And this is young kids. 
this is a uh, young men. That was young men. Um, there's there's so many more that I can I can go into. But you know something, there's so many other issues that I should be going into as well. Mm. For an example, I've got a list of doctors here. I really want to talk to you about these because these are intriguing. Um, one of them, I've got, I've researched every one of these doctors instantly. So, on here we've got, as you can see, Doctor K O Milner, mm -hmm. and then here we've got Sergeant, what's his name? Oh. William Sergeant. Yeah, William Sergeant. We've got John M Bowley here, who's a confirmed CIA doctor, by the way, and his research. Um, preferences were into parental separation so he was researching parents and how they coped when they were separated from the child but he was also studying the child and how it coped without the parent yeah. and he was a cia confirmed doctor okay working for mk ultra and you know what mk ultra yeah. is yeah william Sargent is a confirmed cia doctor Okay, he wrote many books, Battle for the Mind is, uh, Comes to Light, which is a really good book, to be honest with you, you know. He's a bit of a madman, but it made sense when you read his book. It makes yeah. sense where he's coming from. He was Milner's registrar. Now, do you know what he did? He run the zombie ward. You have to type in the zombie ward on Google. William Sargent, the zombie ward, it happened in the King College uh, Hospital. He worked alongside, am I allowed to say any names? Yeah, fuck it, yeah. Um, the truth of the matter is, our lovely MP David Owen, who's alive and kicking down there in uh, Westminster, shall we say. Yeah, we know about Westminster. Yeah. Um, he, um, he worked with William Sargent. So, so don't tell me that the government did not know what mm. was going on in yeah. Aston Hall. It's impossible. Yeah. Because he's been an MP for how long? Mm -hmm. And at the time, he's the same MP who was responsible for the contaminated blood that came over from America. Plus, if it's run by the NHS or any NHS is government run. So exactly. they'll be funding it. Exactly. Yeah. So, so all, all of these doctors that are named on here, I've researched each and every one of them. Okay. Um, in, the, there's several on there that are... MK Ultra doctors. Mm -hmm. Now, MK Ultra, as you know, was an experiment that came about from the CIA, right? And what they were doing was they were basically using diff. There was several, several different MK Ultra operations. There was loads. There was Bluebird. There was, there was load, right? But they were very, very interested in sodium amateur and this truth rock. Yeah. Right. This seemed to be like the most powerful thing at the time. And what they were doing was they were using um, lads who'd been out to war and the army and all the rest of it, traumatised lads coming back, and then they'd given this truth serum and they, they, they said it was like a, a psychical, a, 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 a psychical a, inside the body. Once they had this drug, they'd release all of the things that was troubling them and they'd come around and they'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Well, we were kids. We hadn't been to war. So what were they doing? I believe they were doing different concoctions of drugs. And I believe that Milner, either for himself or for other people who got money from research grants, namely this one that I'm referring to that was given out in 1969 by the Home Office, um, I believe that they were all trying to be the big I am, the big man, and I found a perfect answer of using sodium amatel combined with mesulane. Do you know what mesulane no. is? Mesulane is basically an, a, a stimulant LSD, right? Combined with legactyl, combined with blah de blah de blah. And I was fi he was finding the perfect concoction. And that's what it was all about between them all. They were all mad psychiatrists and they were all wanting to be the big man, the big one who made the invention that could control the human mind because there is nothing more powerful than the yeah. human mind. And But also killing kids for it. Killing kids. And a lot of the get, young girls you were getting pregnant, you were getting pregnancy tests also in this place. And STT tests. As young as 12. As young as 12. It's fucking sick. I am going to tell you a story now. I cannot name the person, but I have her permission to tell the story and I have her permission to show you her files, but her name has to be remain anonymous. Okay. Because she has other children. 
and they don't know. She was shipped to Aston Hall in approximately 68. She came from a mother who had Munchausen's by uh, proxy. All of her life, she'd spent her life going to different doctors. This is wrong with my child, that's wrong with my child, nothing wrong with the girl at all. Eventually she took her to Milner. No, she took her to another psychiatrist who shipped her to Milner. She arrives at Aston Hall at 15 years of age to do a pregnancy test, to give a treatment, to do whatever. I'm not going to go into the full detail. She never went home on weekends. She never had no visits. There's no female environment except for Milner. Okay. How did she pop a baby out 11 months later? And why? Well, she shipped from Derbyshire, Aston Hall Hospital, to another town, which I can't mention because of the woman. It would give it an inkling. Why was she shipped to another town, which was approximately from there, I would say it's at least... 50, 60 miles away to give birth. And why, when she went to the nursery to see the child, was the child gone and never been seen since? So it took her kid off her? Yep. She didn't want the kid. She wasn't interested in the kid. I'll tell you straight. She admits her. She couldn't understand how she was pregnant. To her, it was like, what the fuck's going on? Which I can understand. So she didn't want nothing to do with the kid because she didn't understand. But then when the baby was born, she had a curiosity. The baby was born deformed. They did discover she was pregnant while they were still injecting her. I've read her files. They knew she was pregnant. They were still giving her these drugs. I've read her files. I can get you the files. But unfortunately, the name has to be crossed out. Okay. So what's the connection with uh, Mona and Jimmy Savile? How are they connected? Right, well, to be fair on that, I haven't got the golden chain, mm-hmm. but I've got a link. Okay. There's a big difference, Yeah. Uh, apparently, I have got photographs of um, Jimmy Savile at Saxondale Hospital, right? He frequented a lot of places around Derbyshire, okay, in his camper van. Common knowledge. Saxondale Hospital, Baldstones Hospital, Aston Hall Hospital, all came under Nottingham Number 3 Hospital. They were all run by the same area, uh, health authority, yeah? So he frequented Saxondale Sister Hospital. He came from the same town as Milner. There was two years between that age difference. Milner was born in 09. Savile, 2011. They went to the same schools. Milner was the medical superintendent of uh, Broadmoor and Rampton. And same Jimmy Savile had the three run of the place. Mm-hmm. So, coincidence? But he was also, he's been in Aston Hall, Savile. I have I never, think, yeah, I, I've, I've heard that, that yeah. I have heard that, but I cannot confirm mm-hmm. that because I cannot, as I, you've got to remember as well, there was things that happened in Aston Hall that are there in my mind and still coming back to me, but we were drugged up. Yeah, so you can't really, it's, you uh, can't uh, confirm, easy, yeah. you can't confirm. Mm-hmm. But if lot. girls are getting drugged and being pregnant, then you know, you know how dirty shit is getting, do you know what I mean? If you ask me my opinion of what was going on, mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you straight. I've hey, so what is your opi- opinion then? What was going if on? you look at Aston Hall, yeah, if you actually look at the building, there's a great big white mansion, beautiful white mansion. Back in the day, that was used as part of the hospital. It's now private apartments. Milner lived not too far away. And when he drove in his car... He was on his own island, just like Epstein. Yeah? And in that mansion, I'm not joking, you have a look on Google, have a look at how beautiful it was, the mahogany walls, the mahogany desk, everything. Yeah? I think that he had appointments with pedophiles. And they ordered, we were to order. We were a sweet shop. Want a blonde one today, about eight or nine, whatever age, you know. And he would come and drug us up. Because the layout of the hospital was one of, you could have got anybody up them stairs because once he went up them stairs and he was given treatment, the nurses, I found all the information, the nurses weren't allowed to go near that side of the hospital. There was two doors, one on the left, one on the right, yeah? You went in that door, you turned to the left, there was the stairs, you went up the stairs, first door on the right, there was a room where the child's drugged up. Door shut, it's soundproof. 
then he's going over and doing a boy. Well, here's a bigger question for everyone. He never wore a mask. He never wore a mask. So when he's throwing ether on your face, ether hits gravity and rises. Who was getting a bigger whiff of it, me or him? Yeah, both of you are getting a whiff. Yeah. So how did it not affect him? Well, I think he was addicted to it. Used to it. Yeah, used to it. Immune to it. Yeah, well, if you work, you work in a sweet factory, you get used to the smell. Mm -hmm. You work in a whiskey factory, you get immune to it. So you think you were a catalogue for paedophiles? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary to think it is. It's it's heartbreaking to think as well that listen, this shit's going on just now, and they talk about Jimmy Savile. They talk about him and with disabled kids, and even in the morgue, he was fucking apparently with dead bodies and what they were doing or something. Well, hang on a minute. Yeah, that's shit. something that goes yeah. on in my head. We were as close to dead as you're gonna get. Yeah. So what is? The, they're just fucking sick in the mind. Do you know what I mean? The the madness, whatever these. Even you just look at Jimmy Savile, you just know. You just know that. And it's scary to think that all this stuff is coming out about him now. And it, what was all swept under the carpet then? Because a lot of people knew, a lot of people turned their back. Only a certain few came forward. The same as the Epstein stuff in the video with Prince Andrew. That video has been there for years. So why does it only get released now? Do you know what I mean? Well, I'll tell you. When you get these MPs, Cyril Smith comes to mind. Uh, and several other MPs, Rolf Harris comes to mind. These are all Derbyshire. Uh, uh, here you go. Here's, here's a prime example. You go on the internet, you have a look on Cyril Smith on the hazard, right? Mm. Now, why would Cyril Smith go in whatever year it was, I think it was 68, to the Houses of Parliament and make a request for a remand home to be built for girls in Leicestershire? when he was frequenting the remand home in Derby. Must have been an inconvenience travelling all the way to Derby, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Do you understand where I'm yeah, coming yeah. from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you look and you read all of these things on hazards of certain MPs that are now coming to light, you just think, well, but you know what? They've all got a Derbyshire connection. The East Midlands seems to me to be the catch hole of the paedophiles. The, um, the, hub. The, hub, the hub. The hub. Everything regarding paedophilia seems to be linked in originally to the East Midlands, Derbyshire, Nottingham, in particular Nottingham. That beach would, um, mm -hmm. children's home, what people suffered there was astronomical, you know. See, because you're speaking out about it and exposing some nasty names, do you ever feel for your life? Yep. Death only takes a second, doesn't it? Yeah. I ain't bothered. Yeah, fuck them. You know what? If I can just do one thing in my life, one thing, if God said to me, what would you like? Here's my answer. I'd like to take all the children and I'd like to tell them what grooming is. Because they haven't got a clue. We're all going on about grooming this and there's groomers that and there's paedophiles on the internet. Who is getting them children? And saying, this is what grooming is. This is when somebody's doing this, this is grooming. So the poor kids are going around, terrified of grooming, don't know what grooming is, and no one is educating them. Do you think we should put that in schools from as early as primary one? What's happening, grooming, and to what to look out for? I know people look out for uh, stranger danger and stuff like that, but to get into depth and realise, because I've spoke about it before, I'm in good contact with one of the leading polygraph experts in the UK, who's also brought in eye recognition, so it's 100%, he says it's, he doesn't want to say 100%, but I believe it's 100% accurate where he can't fucking lie. So shouldn't this be brought in for priests, school teachers, people who work with kids to answer the question, are you sexually attracted to kids? If so, then you're not getting the job. Because this is, you know yourself, the biggest groomers and paedophiles come across as the sweetest, nicest people in the world. And you're shocked as hell when you find out about them. Yes, but... We're forgetting about the children. Mm -hmm. And it should be... How can I put it? It's a stigma. It's a stigma. Paedophilia is a stigma. You know, you need to make it more open, more approachable from the children's point of view. Don't be ashamed to talk about it. Somebody's touched you where you don't feel right, you feel uncomfortable. You come and tell me because that's okay. I want to listen. I want to hear about it. You know? 
That's the most important thing. These paedophiles are only as powerful as they silence us. Once our silence is broken, they're not worth nothing. And it's their fear when they've got a little child, eight, nine, God knows, I don't even want to think about it, a little girl, a little boy, and they're saying, I'm going to kill your family. Silencing the child. We've got to be able to get through to the child before the paedophile. Mm -hmm. So make it part of their education. Mm -hmm. You know? And I feel that that is very, very strong. And I think it's the same with drugs as well. You know, the peer pressure, this is where kids go on drugs, peer pressure. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere to turn because it's such a stigma. They've got to be able to say, look, this is part of society. This is a world we live in. You know, his parents are drug dealers over there. Your little mate who are in class 11, he's, they're, they're drug dealers and he wants you to be his mate because they're going to be yeah. pushing drugs. What's the Epstein connection to all this? What's the American connection to all this? I'm not prepared to go into that right now. Okay. But let me tell you, it's there. And oh. I will give it to you. The reason I don't want to give you that right now to give you a fair answer is I've got a good, a good, good friend who's a professional researcher who's entrusted that information to me. And it's her work for her to, okay. to give out. Mm-hmm. But trust me, it's okay. her. So another thing that you touched on, you showed me earlier, you've got a picture here that's um, a picture of a tattoo. I thought it was freckles, but it's a tattoo. Which is here, There's which a is story in America. Can Let's you... talk about America and Johnny Kosh. Okay, who's that? Johnny Kosh is a little boy who went missing in 1986. Okay. I think it was 86. I can't remember which state. Could have been Philadelphia. And his mother, God bless her and save her, has campaigned and campaigned for the return of her son. He went out one morning on a Sunday morning with his little pull-along thing delivering newspapers. Never returned. Right? 12 months later or sometime later, photographs appear through her letterbox of her son tied up exactly the way we were tied up in Aston Hall, our legs and our hands, except for in gaffer tape. But these children are tattooed. And she identifies her son as tied up. And it's there available on the internet for you to read. I've read it a million times, yeah? And they're tattooed. Why have I got this tattoo on my leg? I was not born with that. That is not a birthmark. You're welcome to t- keep yeah, that. Yeah, we'll throw the picture up so yeah. people can have a better look at right. it as now well. Right, now let's take a look at what goes on with Johnny Kosh. I'm going to take this piece of pen and show you something, right? Mm-hmm. Let me get this, a piece of paper. This is what I... Here, this will do. This will do better. Yeah, just flip the page. So the paedophiles have signs that they use. And one of the signs is an X like this. So let's look at a rocking horse or a rocking chair. And if it was a rocking chair, it would go like that. Yeah? Mm-hmm. With the paedophiles, what they do is they do an X and like that. Now, I can't remember off the detail. You have to look it up yourself. That means either male or female. So it's a marking. So mm-hmm. this child is used to being done by a male or this child is used to being done. Now, let's take a look at these markings. People think I'm off my head. I probably am. Where's my ex? I can't see it now. Yeah, there. There you go. Can you see? Yeah. I'll just put a circle around that so you can pick it up later on, yeah? There you go. Mm-hmm. So you, they've been tattooing people as a mark, as like a, a badge of, for them to, for abusing kids and what they've done with the kids, whether it's me, male, female, because you spoke about Let's back passage, it. front passage Let's face as well. the reality of my story, my in particular, in particular story. What was the chances on reality of me getting out of Aston Hall? Nobody except... I was never supposed to get out of there. I was supposed to live my days there, forgotten. My dad didn't give a shite. You know, let's get real. Mm. My mother definitely didn't give a shite. So, what was the chances of me getting out of Aston Hall? So, where was I going next? Why was I marked? Yeah, it's scary to think that. So why? What, what, but I'm woman enough to handle what, that. A lot of a lot of survivors not handle. What is there? So for anybody that's got these marks, c- come forward. And for anybody that's want to speak out or expose big names, listen. Drop me a message. Come on, because I'm more than happy to let you tell your story. So these were tattooing as their mark, like kids, everyone for sale. I've got no idea. All I know is this tattoo is on my leg, mm-hmm. and nobody can account for it. 
And the only sense I'm making out of it is reading Johnny Hosh's story in America and seeing his tattoo and then matching it with that. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, I might be off my head, whatever, but where did this come from? And have you ever seen a birthmark like that? No. So I thought it was freckles. Well, okay, if it was freckles and I was born with that, mm-hmm. how big would it be across my leg on a baby? And how much would it have stretched by and faded by now? Yeah. Why hasn't it stretched and faded? And what about the Teresa Cooper at the Kendall House scandal? Now, Teresa, God love her. I give the girl, take my hat off to the girl. It was through reading her book that I decided to write mine, right? She um, exposed Kendall House where the young girls were getting drugged up and systematically raped, right? She endured so much suffering. But what's worse for Teresa and her survivors are second birth gener- uh, second generation births where the baby's being born with severe deformities. And we're finding that with the Aston Hall victims as well. And one of the common deformities is, I can't pronounce the name of it, it's where the intestines are born, uh, uh, when they're born, the intestines are on the outside, outside of the body. yeah. Right, and they have mm-hmm. to rip, them, rip wrap it up in um, cling film and do whatever. This has been common with Teresa Cooper's uh, survivors and a couple of ours in Aston Hall. And it all seems to link back to... And where is this um, Kendall House? It was in Kent, I believe. I haven't heard from Teresa for a mm. long time. But she exposed Kendall House, and I think she'd be well worth getting in contact with because i tell you what, her story's amazing. Yeah, well. Yeah, she's... Well, I used to have a number. I haven't got it now. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's, from looking from the outside, it's for me, it's all connected. All these paedophile rings, all these high doctors... We've got some serious pulls with the MPs, with the police. It's a big cover-up. But every MP, mm-hmm. near enough every MP, started off as a doctor. Haven't you noticed? No. As he says that on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they all start off as doctors mm-hmm. and go up to MPs. So what do you think needs to happen? Just people talking more out about it? No. I think the first thing that should happen is that we did have a lot of survivors where the parents did come to Aston Hall and demand their children back, but Milne had the power to refuse them. I think that the doctors have got far too much power and that the power should be took off the doctors. I can think of, I don't want to name anybody, but I can think of a situation at the moment now that's very prominent in the news about a little baby in London, you know, where the doctors are saying, no, we're going to, you know, a fight for life case. No, he's not going to survive. Yeah. Um, he's got this wrong with him. He was born that way and he's four months old and whatever. I can think of another similar case up in Liverpool not too long ago, which you're probably well aware of. The doctors had too much to say for that child. The parents should have been given their right. They brought that baby in this world. They've got the right mm-hmm. to make what decisions. Nothing is more stronger than a mother's intuition. Yeah. And the same with uh, the little girl, Madeline McCann. Kate and Jerry, that Jerry McCann was a doctor. He was a doctor. He used to work at Celtic Park. So he did. Yeah. And they say there's a lot of backstories towards that, what they used to do. There's definitely a lot of untold stories and secrets with that as well. And um, that's come from a good source. I refuse to to say any more on that. I want you to look up what I've written on there. Okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's something else. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, connected. Yeah. yeah. While I've been doing research onto what I've been looking into, I obviously come across a lot of stuff. And one thing can lead to another. And, yeah. So you're, you're constantly searching just now. You try to get answers, some sort of closure to find out why it happened, what it done, and how connected with it is, Reverend, because you're unlocking a lot of doors. We've spoke earlier as well. We've been speaking there's quite a lot. A lot. Of the, there's a lot of um, stuff that hasn't been crossed here right Mm -hmm. yeah of course because you you want the concrete evidence first i want the concrete evidence but what i have learned is this it's all about black men Hmm. it really is right so they entice one another into abuse children go with boys take drugs whatever then they put a hold of them it might they might not be pedophiles but they will end up pedophiles because they get blackmailed You've got to do this if you want to be in a boys' club. That's what happened with El Mouse. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about. Are these doctors as well? They were taking photos of you in Ashton Hall as well? I remember coming round, and I'll never forget that. I came around, and it was like a big flash, 
And I can still see that. I can still see his face. It reminds me of a pike. His face reminds me of a pike fish. He was just an old man, but I've mentioned him to other survivors and they've recognised him. They know who he is. I can't remember what his name was. I came round and he was taking pictures. And what about the tape recorder? Yeah, what was that? I don't know. It was a tape recorder, but I now know it was a tape recorder. But at the time, I didn't know what it was and what a tape recorder was. Do you think they were videoing, raping the kids and drugging them? Well, like I've said in my book, I hate when it comes on the news, you know, such a paedophile was found with so many images. I don't know if I'm on them in images. And there is no photos of me when I was a kid. And if they're the only ones that exist, then I want, I want to die. It's horrible. Mm-hmm. You know? But I'm hoping that obviously you coming forward and, and shedding mel- shedding light on this, it's because it is sick. And I speak to a couple of boys who do a lot of stuff with the people involved in grooming gangs to try and shut them down and close it off. People don't realise the extent of how deep this goes. This goes deep. And the people who are the elite are the ones who's controlling it as well. You're 100% right. Yeah. And the likes of me will be killed off for making a video like this. Yeah, but fuck it, I could be as well. But do you know what? At least we're going with our head held tie. Do you know what I mean? There's no point in it. I'm you not could be a bad bus yeah. when you walk outside, mate, especially gonna, if you've got a spine yeah. like mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to uh, shy away from trying to uncover some stories that for kids, I've got fucking kids and I know how far I would go to protect them and so be it. You know, like I said to your friend before, I'll never forget the day when I looked at my ruby rubber bones arm. It's so skinny. And the thought of someone sticking a big needle in that arm, maliciously, maliciously, which it is maliciously, it just breaks her in pieces. It just, it takes away every, 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 everybody that you are, every bit of your humanity, it takes it away, it just crumbles your mace. Because you've been through that much, it probably it doesn't feel real, but you probably don't accept how much shit you actually went through. I and mean, when you start judging it, wait a minute, if that happened to that little girl who I love, that would break your heart. People don't realise the extent you've of what you've went no through. You've got no idea, mate. If somebody done that to my little Ruby, I would take a JCB, mate, and I would put it through their fucking head. Mm-hmm. And I'd enjoy every minute of it. But nobody would have done that for me, and that was the power that the doctor had. Yeah. So they're taking the power away from the kids because they know no one's coming to chap the door to take their kid back. The exactly. vulnerable kids, the homeless kids. He, that, he, he made sure... That we fitted the criteria. Yeah, there was no trace. So they would have yeah. had a checklist. No mum and dad. No visitors. Yeah. No visitors, no letters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was their check. Oh, they're not going home this weekend because got no home to go to. Oh, well, we'll have him then. So if they're dying or missing, nobody cares? They just run away. Yeah. Are they run away? We don't know. Because mm-hmm. I've told you, for the period of time that he was there, it, equ- it equals 14,400 treatments. But where's the 14,400 people? Mm. So just a select few of people who went through All right, let's say there's 14,400. We've got 220 something that's come forward. Say another 220 was dead. Let's say another 220 has left the country. We're still missing people. Yeah. You started your Facebook page as well. Yeah. For people to come forward and give them a voice. Yeah. How's that page going? I've had several, I've had a lot of problems. Um, what I have come up with, uh, uh, one in particular guy, proper weirdo. Um, <laughs> oh no, proper weirdo. I really entrusted him and I thought he was helping me with the research. But what he was doing, which was a dirty trick to do, he was befriending the survivors, getting their stories to publish a book. And he's published a book. Mm-hmm. It's done not. No, don't plug it anyway, don't see even mention no, it. No, I won't, but that's what you're up against. Mm-hmm. And then... You know, if that man had come forward and said, do you know something, I want to write a book, I would have been the first person, as you know, yeah. to help him out. Mm-hmm. But it, they go sly about it, you know. And for all of the people that have helped out, and I can't count how many how many hours, how many days, how many months, I've sat with people, consoling them, getting them round to... There's one lady, she's lovely, but she never spoke about what her, her Aston Hall experience, ever. Ever, ever, ever. Until my book came out. So she seen me on the news. And I was the first person she spoke to. So that should make you proud then, that you're helping others. So you should take inspiration from that, that 
what you're doing and speaking out. You don't realise the impact it's helping on others who are too scared. For all those years who probably blamed themselves. They were ashamed. They were ashamed. Mm -hmm. And two weeks after me talking to her at length, I hope she sees this, she'll know what I'm talking about. She, um, she was self-harming. Badly self-harming. Um, two weeks after talking to her, she phoned me up and she went, Bob, I've told my family. Because of you, she said. You've pulled my family together. She said there was that rift there between us because I was keeping secrets and they didn't know what the secret was. Mm -hmm. But now she said, it's, she's just had a big payout. Now they can understand why yeah. she was doing it. Yeah. I'll tell you what, and I've got to say this, and I really need to say this because I owe this. The one person who helped me big time was the first person who believed me. And that was Alan Sellers in Bodden Turner in Liverpool. When I went to see them, I was trying for days and days phoning solicitors, listen, this happened, I've got this documentation. As soon as you say mental hospital, slam went on the phone. But I phoned this company up. And when I went in to see him, he listened to me and he's very, very um, laid back guy. You know, you, you can't read him. You can't read if he's judging you or he's just a laid back guy. And he went, I believe you. Do you know when that man said that? Wow. Sense of relief for you. Wow. It was like he took an iron coat off my shoulders and I could breathe. Mm -hmm. But out of all of the people that did help me, Alan Sellers got to be up there with the stars. But there was a doctor in Liverpool, an oncologist. I had cervical cancer, I was really bad. And I couldn't deal with doctors because of Milner. I'd take panic attacks. No trust at all. No trust. I'd be okay with doctors, but if there's a certain age, certain hair, certain, especially a certain voice, like a Queen's English voice, yeah. I'd feel my heart go. Certain. Anyway, they put me in this side room, right, because of my panic attacks. And I was really ill, and this doctor came in with that voice, that Queen's, and it may as well have been Milner, and he went, now nah, she can go to theatre in 15 days. She, I was in agony. Well, I mashed that room up. I went like a ballistic mad one, right? And Dr. MacDonald came in. He said, Bob, sit down, we'll try. I said, you're not going to believe me. He said, try me. I told him what happened at Aston Hall. And you know what? He said, I believe you. That was the best moment in a step to recovery, when the doctor, who I trusted, who was helping me with cancer, believed me and said, I, I believe you. I mean, I, it's just, I can't, I can't express, I can't, it's just mad. How hard was that, that period when you're trying to tell your story and get it out there that no one would believe you because of the mental institution you've been labelled with? How hard was that for you? It was impossible. Did you ever think that And the ex-husband made it really harder as well. Because yeah. people in my social circle, I don't believe it, she's been in the mental hospital, her own husband says it. He was a horrible man. But that's by the by. He, but he made it harder for me to express myself because of what he'd done. What made you keep going then? I think what happened was, I had a flashback in 2015. I think it was 2015. A really bad panic attack. I'd woke up in the night in a bad way. And it had been happening all my life. Cluster headaches, panic attacks, flashbacks. And the smell of ether. I can't. Or if I see a pack of fishermen's friends, I go ballistic. And uh, 2015, I'd had a, a really bad time. And I went to the doctor. And I said, doctor, please, said, dig deeper in the medical files. This is doing my head in because I know it happened. My kids are all grown up now, but these questions are still unanswered. And she shouted at me, she went, well, why, if it's troubling you so much, are you bothering? Why are you going on the internet? But what I was doing on the internet, I was that drugged up in Aston Hall. I was getting the name of the place wrong. Anyway, I found the place, an urban um, photographer fella. He'd gone in there and took pictures, and so another girl had left a comment and said, it happened to her, what happened to her? And I commented on that, and then she found me on social media. And then the next minute, there's three of us, three women. And I went, well, if there's three, there's 33. And if there's 33, there's 333. And that's where I started the group. But what you got when the group come, started developing was you got people coming in who thought they could come in, 
they didn't know what you'd already done or achieved or how far along you'd gone into this research. And they think, right, I'm here. I'm taking this over. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. They didn't realise we'd done it all. We'd organised everything. And then suddenly they'd go, well, for an example, there's this woman. And she wrote a book in 2096, I think it was, or 86, about her life. But she writes five pages about Aston Hall because she was in Aston Hall. Five and a half pages about Aston Hall in this book. And the jealousy out of her, because I'd exposed Aston Hall via my book, The Hospital. The jealousy was like mind-blowing. Absolutely. In the end, it was that bad. I had to get a picture, I downloaded a picture of her book and a picture of my book. Her book is not called The Hospital. I'm not going to say what it's called. It's got nothing to do with a hospital, right? It's got a picture of a pair of eyes on. And I said, put them up in a group. I said, hey, spot the difference, <laughs> right? Mm. Because I was dealing with it every single day. You know, it was just... Mm -hmm. They try to do the right thing to bring people forward, but there's a lot of hatred and jealousy coming with it. A lot, yeah, yeah. a lot. And that guy who wrote the book and took the people's stories, he's caused problems for them families. Yeah. He really has. Yeah, that sad bastard. Um... Is there anything you'd like to finish up on? Because I know you're going to come on for a, a part two where we're going to have more information for people to look into certain things. But for anybody watching, for anybody just now before we finish up that's maybe watching, that's maybe struggling to come forward and they're going, that resonates with your story, what advice would you give for them? Contact me. I'm, I'll listen to you. What's your Facebook page? Um, just contact me, Barbara O'Hare, on Facebook. Personally, it, that way you don't have to come in the group. You can just send me a message. I will listen to you. I will phone you. If you don't want to come forward now and you want to come forward in six months' time, you want time, you just want to know there's someone there that's going to listen, I'm there. And that's how I'm going to give my life for the rest of my life to get these people to get their closure. Some of our survivors are 70, 80 years of age. One of them is on her way to meet her twin brother who she hasn't seen since she was 15 in Australia because she's just got to pay out of the solicitor. You know... That is my achievement. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. You should something. be proud of what you're doing just now, Barbara, and I'm proud of you and um anything I can help with, you know I'm only a phone call away. Well, James, if they can contact you, if they want to talk mm -hmm. to you, you know, and you want to give them my number yeah. personally, because you don't want to come on social media, I'd mm -hmm. appreciate that. Yeah. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't want to contact me, contact Bond bon Turner in Liverpool and tell them you're a survivor of Aston Hall or any other organisation where this kind of stuff might have took place because mm -hmm. it did take place all over the place. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to finish up on? No, I'd just like to say thank you, James. Yeah, it's been a pleasure in your story and you're a very brave woman and it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you, Barbara. All the best for the future and I'll see you soon. 